My name is Ashley Myers. I am uh, on the mayor's uh, office of, I'm part of the mayor's office of civic innovation in San Francisco. So I work for the San Francisco mayor. And um, I'm doing a one year residency there. So I'm what's called an innovation fellow. And I'm about nine months in. And one of the things I've been working on over the course of my year is uh, how to help cities in this case, the city of San Francisco, procure, better procure custom software development or web development services. So um, we have basically, we decided we want to commit to working with vendors who work in an agile way and we want to build products in an agile way, but our procurement structures are not set up for that at all. They're very much set up for waterfall. And so I um, started talking to a lot of people in the Code for America community about this and found that it was a common problem and something that a lot of people are tackling. And so our goal in this session is to really dive in, talk about what we learned, and then have a conversation about what you guys are doing. Do you want to introduce yourself, Cindy? Sasan, yes. Hi, my name is Cindy Conway. Um, I am a software engineer with the city and county of San Francisco. I work in the Department of Technology, and I've had the great good fortune of partnering with the uh, Mayor's Office of Civic, Civic Innovation on the Affordable Housing Project, which is what we'll be discussing today. And uh, yeah, just here to share also what I've learned and hear your comments about what your experiences have been with procurement and, and Agile. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so kind of our agenda here is first to go around and have you all introduce yourselves. Um, and then uh, we're going to give a brief presentation, trying to keep it to about 10 or 15 minutes on what we've learned so far, just to get us all on the same page and kind of set context. Um, and then we want to move into a group discussion and really use this hour for all of you to have a chance to pose questions, share your insights. Um, you're welcome to ask us questions while we give our sort of slides also. But uh, the more you ask them, the less time we have for discussion at the end. So either way is fine with us. Um, but we really do want this to be participatory. We're not here to talk at you because we are learning about this just as much as everyone else is, I think. So starting with intros, I'd love to pass this mic around and have you all very briefly introduce yourselves. So who are you? Um, sort of how do you identify? Are you a technologist or a purchaser? Are you a vendor? Are you inside government? Um, and then kind of rank yourself uh, in one, or it's not really rank, put yourself in one of these categories. So. Uh, both Agile and Procurement are new to me, like hold my hand here. <laughs> um, two, I get Agile, I know what it is, but it's the Procurement part that I really want to talk about. Um, or if you're in category three, you understand Procurement, maybe you're a purchaser or a contracting officer, but you don't uh, know how to apply it to Agile. And then four, um, I'm in the tiny, slim group of people <laughs> that has successfully either procured or sold Agile development services to government, in which case you will probably share a lot with us today. And then um, if you want to, share one question that's on your mind that you'd love for us to talk about today. Cindy's going to capture them. And um, if you want to uh, echo or support one you've already heard, we'll just put a tally mark by it so we can see which questions are really common themes here. Sean, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is uh, Sean Vong. I am a founder and uh, managing partner for a small company called Effectual LLC. We're based out of San Diego, specialized in... Uh, uh, network engineering services, uh, specifically within the DOD sector and specifically in the, the Navy, uh, U.S. Navy. Um, for, um, probably in the number two category, um, and I kind of asked this question earlier, but you know, just wanted to um, understand more uh, in, in the long-term pro uh, procurement and acquisition strategy within DOD and how, you know, are we still going with the LPTA for engineering services, which in my opinion doesn't really make sense. Lowest price, yeah. uh, lowest price technically acceptable um, acquisition strategy. Um, I think that may make sense from a purely hardware and, uh, and you know, product uh, procurement perspective, but from engineering services, I think we need to, to reevaluate our, our acquisition strategy. So maybe the question is kind of around for, for services, the balance of quality versus cost Correct. in procurement. Okay, great. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jesse Wolcher. I work at the San Francisco Department of the Environment. Um, uh, I work on online communication and um, uh, working with uh, different vendors uh, in that space to improve the communication of our environmental programs. So I identify as a government. Um, oh. And then uh, I think I actually fit somewhat into bucket number two and a little bit of four, but mostly two. And uh, uh, a question that's been on my mind for quite some time um, that I think Agile would be good to kind of cross-pollinate is how can you, um, uh, is it possible to like have an Agile workflow where you have multiple jurisdictions all contributing to build like a regional solution possibly? And what would that look like? Cool. 
Hi, uh, I'm Michael Grass. Uh, I am based in Washington, D.C. and in Seattle. Uh, I am an editor uh, for a news publication from Atlantic Media that covers state, county, and municipal government around the country. Uh, tech, uh, basically the nuts and bolts of how governments work. Um, I'm just here to observe. Uh, I write uh, quite a bit about uh, technology at the, in state governments, and procurement is obviously a, a big problem at the state level as well. Uh, and uh, just want to sort of hear uh, what you guys are uh, all dealing with, and just become a better informed uh, journalist on uh, this issue. Thanks. If, you're, if you just joined the room, we're kind of identifying ourselves, uh, and you might fall into more than one of these categories, uh, who you are, what you do, and then um, if you had to put yourself into a category, uh, which one of these four, and then if you have a pressing question you'd love for us to talk about today, sharing that with the group. Sure. Um, Carlos Moreno. I'm the co-captain of the Tulsa Brigade. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely a technologist, although I'm a graphic designer by trade. Um, and I would say that I fall under number two. Um, Agile is very similar to um, user-centered or human-centered design, and it's at least in its beginning processes. Um, and as a brigade, I guess this gets into the question or issue that I, I came here for. Um, as a, as a brigade, we continually run into um, open source or agile techniques as being an alternative to um, enterprise software solutions that are okay. adopted by our city. Okay. And so, where a city might um, purchase an, a legacy system for, say, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, five hundred thousand, a million, um, we're we're producing the same, uh, or at least what we perceive to be the same, uh, software solutions for um, very little or minimal or even no cost. Um, and so, the question I have is, what does it look like for cities to adopt um, open source technologies and um, um, how do we talk to cities in their language? Um, yep. So how, how does procurement handle open source or deal or interact with open source? I'm going to push you guys to keep your question to like one sentence. Give us your question so we can get around the room. Hi, my name is uh, Mark. I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, I have done uh, pro bono consulting with the city of San Francisco. Um, and I am a, I'll put myself in technologist and under number two. Uh, I understand Angel, but the procurement part is definitely new to me. Um, I provided some insight into agile development um, while I was there. But the question on my mind is, uh, how do you think the lessons that you have picked up can actually scale out to other cities and other governments, um, given different Great. scenarios and such? Great. My name is Arlene. I work with Cindy and um, and Ashley um, on a, a few projects. But um, I know Agile, but I'm not so sure about the procurement part of it. Um, I guess I'm here to learn more about how do how this vendor in Agile development handle the proposal for procurement when it comes to when they think that it's Agile. It's an iterative process, and how do you build procurement? And how is it? cost-wise. Okay. Great. Thank you, Arlene. Yeah. My name is Carol. I work for a state government, California state government organization um, called the Little Hoover Commission. We're a government oversight entity. We're currently looking at ways to make state government more efficient and effective and how to improve interactions with government. And so I would call myself more of a three. I don't know that I'm a pro at procurement, but I understand <laughs> it. But I also know a little bit about Agile. I'm here to learn to see what the state can learn from San Francisco. Great. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Star Wilbraham. I actually work with the United States Small Business Administration. Um, and so I probably don't actually fit in specifically what we're talking about today, but um, Small Business Administration has a whole government contracting and business development piece. So working from that end of it, we've there's a, you know, how are how is federal government procuring services such as this? And then specifically, I work on a, an initiative called the Startup in the Day Initiative where we are encouraging cities to make it easier for cities 
uh, for entrepreneurs to get started, um, perhaps even in one day. Um, and so as we develop these um, and work with these cities, uh, they will no doubt need to procure uh, development services. And so whatever um, the question is, how can, from my position in federal government, help these cities and then how can we help entrepreneurs? Okay, great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is David Acevedo. Uh, I was in government, now I could be a technologist. I used to work uh, formerly in the Environmental Quality Board in Puerto Rico, where I successfully procured an agile development yeah. side. Then I worked on the CIO <laughs> office, where I also successfully procured an agile development service. But that's easy, because I'm a certified Scrum Master, so I knew what to look for. But I'm more interested in number two, because Okay. It's very hard to explain that to people who are not already familiar with Agile. Great. Hello, uh, my name is Connor Peterson. I'm with Sacramento Area Council of Governments. Uh, so definitely under government. Uh, I'd say this is all pretty new to me. Okay. Uh, so if you want, you can hold my hand, I guess. But uh, <laughs> I work with shared services and joint contracting. So I believe there's a category already up there for a question. Uh, yeah, agile work across multiple jurisdictions, and I definitely have a strong interest in that. Great. Hi, I'm Mark Roth. I'm with Rally Software, so I'm a vendor. And Rally, we are all about Agile. So uh, definitely number four. Oh. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've actually today being the end of the federal fiscal year, I spent a lot of time on the phone doing number four, selling services to uh, the federal government, including SBA back there. Um, and I guess uh, for me, a uh, question I have is, you know, can pure agile be, you know, used in government or does it need to be more of a hybrid approach? Ooh. Great. Uh, hi, my name's Norris. I work at Code for America on the Digital Front Door Initiative, and we work with uh, city government to help um, them work on their website in more agile ways. Um, so I would consider myself a technologist and under number two Great. as well. Um, the, what question I have, I guess, is just trying to understand really what the bottleneck is to uh, government working more agilely. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it the culture that produces the procurement mm -hmm. process that makes it hard? Is it the legal aspects? Is it the policy that just they mm -hmm. want to work together but they can't because there's some legal issues around there? Or is it like there's just some, the market doesn't exist? I'm just trying to understand that a little bit more, like what where the bottleneck really is. <laughs> yeah, that's what I Great. assumed. Let's, let's power through the rest of the introductions in the next five minutes. Challenge to all of you. Hi, my name is Erica Brown. I'm with the Lauren John Arnold Foundation, so I fall in a category outside of these. Um, I'll skip. I'll add just to your question um, and say, are there opportunities where um, we can experiment with some of the things that he mentioned and, and test um, modifications to the pr procurement system and see how they lead to better outcomes? And how familiar are you with procurement or agile? Procurement, yes. Agile, no. Okay, great. Uh, Vince Pernetti, I'm with the mayor's office at the city of New York, um, and I've dealt more, I'm an, I would definitely, I'm government and I'm three, and I've dealt more with uh, health and human service procurements, not really uh, agile technology. Great. Ron Villa, I'm uh, deputy chief operating officer for the city of San Diego. I uh, oversee five departments, government, uh, two of the departments I oversee is department of technology and purchasing, so I'm number four. Okay. And uh, we've successfully done uh, our website redevelopment under Agile. I don't have a question, but I'm trying to coin a new phrase, Agile win. What does it mean? Well, uh, rather than quick wins or low-hanging fruit, it's an Agile win. Like it. Um, I am a technologist. Um, uh, I'm not sure where I fall, because I usually just live in the, I'll do it for a dollar under the procurement limit. <laughs> um, so let's just call me a two. Um, and my question is, do you guys, do we as a group feel that the more we work around, the worse the process gets? Can you pass it to the ones behind you too? 
Uh, my name's Eric. I'm from Chicago, and I'm part of Shy Hack Night. I would consider myself a technologist, but I've also worked for government, uh, which is why I'm so passionate about procurement reform. Uh, it gets me very emotional. Um, so I guess I'd be a number two. Uh, and I guess my question would kind of be to piggyback off of that sort of question of like, why is procurement the way that it is? So I guess if I flip that around, my question would kind of be like, what do we have to lose by changing procurement processes? Like, what are we giving up? I guess would be my question. Yeah. Back up here. Got a few yeah. more. Are you good? CJ, you want to just project? <laughs> Great. Hi, my name is Barry Roeder, and I'm with the Mayor's Office of Housing in San Francisco. I'm part of the project that Ashley and Cindy are part of. I'm co-project managing it. So I'm kind of government and technologist yep. uh, and a two. Um, so my question actually is how far into government do you have to sell Agile? Ooh. So as you kind of start <laughs> pushing on culture of government, how far up do you, the chain do you have to convince that this is the way to go? Hi, my name is Wendy Fong. I'm a lead designer at Exigy, and we are a uh, design agency working with the mayor's office and Ashley and Cindy and Barry on housing platform. Uh, we work in Agile, and I, unfortunately, I'm not the one doing the contracting, so I'm just here to observe and learn. I'm going to call you a four because you guys did sell to us this Agile process, so. <laughs> I'm a two. Zach's a four. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Uh, my name's Rohan, and this is Mitra, and we're uh, with a startup called Napa. Uh, we worked on healthcare.gov, and um, uh, what we do is produce outstanding user experiences on rock-solid technology infrastructure. Um, we are a vendor. Um, I would say we fall in bucket number two, and we actually follow something uh, at the federal level called Agile Fall, combination of Agile and Waterfall. Mm -hmm. um, and our question is um, is around how in the, the procurement process do you actually test whether somebody can, can actually do Agile? Because one thing we've seen at the federal level is, um, you know, people have definitely noticed the trend of, oh, Agile, you know, this is where everything's going. People want Agile. Um, so they're very quick to adopt language uh, that reflects, yeah, we're, we're Agile, we do this and that. Uh, how do you actually test that? Because we've seen cases where um, people can sort of talk, to, talk the talk, but not actually walk the walk and, and produce working software on a consistent basis. So uh, what can procurement do to, to sort of mm -hmm. sniff that out? Hi, I'm Mitra. I start at Nava tomorrow, which is why Rohan spoke for me. <laughs> and by the way, congratulations for the tech award. <laughs> I'm Fumi Yamasaki. I'm a program manager for Google. Um, I think I'm technologist and two. I'm here to learn about what you guys learned and learn about best practices. Great. Got a couple over here. Did you guys want to introduce yourselves? For them. Is, how do you help the customer, so in this case the government purchaser uh, side of things, understand their responsibility Yeah, so we're going to talk a little about that, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a little bit on that. I would love to talk more about it, yeah. Great. I missed that one. What was on? Um, she, uh, she talked about how to make procurement itself more agile while still respecting all the rules and the okay. purpose behind them. 
Um, oh wait, wrong direction. Okay, so now we're gonna just take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about our journey learning about how to do this this year, um, successfully so, I think. And uh, it sounds like most of the people in the room are pretty familiar with Agile, so we'll probably focus more on the procurement side of it and move a little quickly through the slides about what Agile is and, and how it works, which we included because we weren't sure what the makeup of the room would be. <laughs> so um, those of you for whom Agile is still kind of a new concept, keep with us, ask questions to the people near you or in the round table afterward, and um, I think I think we'll be able to give you enough that you can understand where we're going when we get to the procurement part. Here you go. I don't remember which direction it is. They're kind of, they look the same, but one of these arrows. Here you go. I guessed right. Okay, so I will be very brief. Like Ashley just mentioned, when we were putting this together, we're like, oh, if Agile is really new to most people in the room, then it's going to be really hard to talk about procuring it. But it seems like we have a lot of experience. So I'm going to go through these slides very, very fast. If there's something along the way that feels like really critical to understand and it's new to you, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, so Agile Software Development, a group of software development methods in which requirements and solutions evolve, very important, through collaboration between self-organizing cross-functional teams. Um, a couple of other terms you might hear connected to Agile, Agile Delivery Services, which is basically just the vendors that can provide services to you in an Agile fashion, and Agile Architecture, which is really sort of the technological architecture that would be used to support an Agile process. So waterfall, who here has heard of waterfall process? Raise your hand. Right, so waterfall is the way that I started out creating software in the 90s and the O's and we tried to do it this way, where we would analyze really, really hard and try to understand everything about the problem. Then we would come up with an ironclad plan on how to do that thing and then we would design, build, test, and deploy. And then what would happen? Well. Nobody would use the software <laughs> that we just built because it didn't suit their needs. Or we would spend a whole bunch of time and money developing a feature that we would go back in the database and look and like, nobody used that thing, but gosh, it costs a lot of money to make. So that's the way we used to do things and it was those problems that me as a technologist made me really perk my ears up and listen when I heard about this agile thing. And I'm like, well, that's really different and that seems to solve some of my problems. So if we look more at the agile approach, we do all of these things, but we do them in a really short, compressed way so that we have an opportunity for feedback often. Because in software development, we have to ask our, our users a lot of questions where they have to make predictions. Like, are you going to have to add a note to that task when you create it? Oh, yes, I'm definitely going to need to do that. Well, maybe you do it, maybe you don't, right? How often are you going to go to the gym next week? Right, five times. Now, if I go talk to you next week, how often did you actually go to the gym? Right, it's just part of human nature. So one of the things that really attracted me to Agile was that I can like put it out there, get it in the real world, and see what people are really gonna do about it. So again, waterfall, no way to quickly validate um, the predictions that are being made. Money and time is invested in those wrong predictions. And to me, that equates to risk. I feel that this is a really risky way to create software. So if we're going to do Agile, what does that mean? How do we get to doing these quick iterations in a way that's actually going to work? Because it's going to require a lot of collaboration in order to make this thing happen. So we definitely value working solutions over documentations. So the small sprints actually get deployed, people actually use them. We um, respond to change. So instead of saying, no, no, I have a plan. We're not gonna change anything now, we're gonna stick with it. We say that change is normal and we adapt to that. We collaborate over contract negotiations, right? Me as an engineer, I succeed when my clients succeed, when my users are happy and they succeed when I succeed. And finally, um, prioritization over deadlines. So if I tell you as an engineer that I'm gonna deliver a certain set of features to you and I'm gonna give it to you in a month, how many people are gonna pad that estimate if they have other dependencies on that, right? So we build in the fact that we know that deadlines don't work really well. So instead of going with deadlines, let's go with prioritizing things. Let's make sure we're always working on the thing that's most important. Mm. Okay, <laughs> huh. that was Agile in a very quick nutshell. 
Um, there's a few terms that Ashley is going to use, so I'm going to go over them really quickly. So as she's talking about procurement, um, you know what she's referring to. So a user story is something that in Waterfall you might have called a feature. It's got a very particular structure where you find out who has the need, what the need is, and why they have the need, and they have acceptance criteria. So this is kind of a good example we borrowed from Exegy on what a good user story looks like. Story points are a way to um, <laughs> story points are a way to figure out how hard a task is going to be to do. So in Agile, we're less interested in figuring out how long it's going to take to do the task. Why? Because I'm going to go to the gym five times next week. We're really bad at predicting. But we do have a pretty good sense of how hard something's going to be, and that can really help the business owner or the product owner prioritize. Like, do I really want them to do this really hard thing, or do I want them to get these like three little easy things done? So we use story points for that. And we might say like a hard story is five points, but like an easy story is one. Velocity. That's how much work a team can consistently get done in a given amount of time. The focus here is more on consistency. So you can s anticipate how much work is going to be able to get done in a sprint, which is just another word for an iteration. And you want to do that over a period of time. So like after three sprints, I can tell that this particular team on a particular project can get um, six story points done per two week sprint. And so the final piece of lingo that we're going to talk about is backlog. These are all your user stories over here. The engineers have looked at them, and they've decided how many user or story points go to them. And then the product owner has gone through and prioritized those. And so we call the backlog just those list of prioritized features. And I'll Great. pass it over to Ashley. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so in theory, you could be doing Agile with an in-house team. You may have a team, if you're in government at your city, who is practicing Agile. Um, if you have a team that builds custom software or web applications for you, you can ask them about that. Um, but in reality, what often happens is that it's just you, and then you manage a program or an initiative, and you know you need some new web product or web solution for your program. And you may have like sort of done your due diligence. There's nothing off the shelf SaaS solution available for you that you want to buy a specific enterprise solution. And you have become convinced that you need to build something from scratch and you want to hire someone to build it. And so, you know, you might have like a friend in the IT department who's doing their best they can to support you. Um, and they may be even willing to spend some time with your vendors once you hire them or help maintain the application. But they're really busy. They have a lot of people calling them. They have other stuff on their plate. So this is the situation most people in, are in, and they are looking for um, a, a team, a firm, that can help them as an outside vendor build their new product. And this is the situation that I found myself in in January and February when I joined the city. I was tasked with helping um, this amazing uh, group of people over at the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, which is where Barry works now. Um, and they were committed to building a new digital product to search and apply for affordable housing online. And they had worked with a previous vendor who was uh, using a more waterfall process, uh, nominally agile though, which I think someone pointed out often happens, and, um, and it really having bad results. And so my partner, uh, a man named Michael Solomon, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, uh, was really committed to doing agile. He was convinced, uh, thanks in part to our Google colleague, Mark, who was a pro bono volunteer. And he, um, he's like, okay, Ash, so like, how do we do it? Like, what does the RFP look like? Like, how do we pay them? Like, what are we paying them for? And um, procurement was really new to me. And I, was, I learned from him that this was the, the model he was working in. So this uh, may be familiar to some of you, but I'll talk through it. So he, A, was used to working in a waterfall methodology. Um, and uh, the way that he did it was what they called fixed price at the city and was really committed to the idea of fixed price. So this analysis, this gray part, and a little bit of the planning he would do in-house. So he would meet with uh, the relevant stakeholders inside and outside, and he would write the statement of work or the requirements, the, pro uh, the product requirements, the specs. And those would often be like 40, 60, 80, 100 plus pages. And um, going down into the detail of like, this website will have this number of pages. Like the nav bar will have these options. Uh, the, uh, this field will have, this form will have these fields with these buttons that will do these things. Like very, very detailed. And um, in a way he was like starting to write feature stories and acceptance or user stories and acceptance criteria, but doing it in a way that was, you know, um, in, a, in a waterfall methodology. And then he'd publish the RFP 
and there'd be a single contract with an exhaustive statement of work, and it was totally focused on product requirements, much more focused on the product requirements than on the uh, vendor requirements. It was, he wasn't talking about what kind of vendor he wanted or what kind of skills or expertise or experience he needed. His uh, past RFPs had focused on the product. And this isn't just Michael, this is the way all city departments have been doing it, and many, many governments have been doing it. Um, and a lot of vendors who work in a waterfall way, this is what they're used to seeing, and it makes sense to them. They read this, and they, on, the, on their end, start to think about what size team would I have, how long would it take us, how much would we charge for that. And so what happens is, whoa, wrong way. Oh, and then also there's often a maintenance contract, which goes sometimes automatically to the person who built it and is like just cash rolling out forever. So what happens is that like this is what he <laughs> he writes and it's like it's so long it, you don't even print it um, and then the vendors come back and they're like sure we can do that for you no problem um, it will cost you your firstborn child and uh, it'll only take six years <laughs> like we'll have it in 2020 <laughs> and um, the guy behind the stack of paper is like what like this doesn't seem that big like. It doesn't seem like it should take six years, and this is like five times the budget I expected, or it's like exactly a dollar under whatever you told them you could spend always. <laughs> and um, really frustrated, but that, that civic-minded local web development firm like didn't even answer. They saw this 300-page RFP, and they were like, mm, no, peace. Like, so those, those bids, those 17 bajillion dollar bids, all came from like big established enterprise IT, um, who saw that and were like, this looks like a normal RFP, we can do this. So, What's the alternative, right? And I, like Michael and I decided we wanted to do Agile. We knew the kind of firm we wanted to work with, a small, local, uh, Agile firm that had experience doing user-centered design. So I did what any good civic hacker would do, and I called my friends in the Code for America network. <laughs> and uh, Jen put me in touch with Tracy Walker at the White House, who is like the guru of Agile uh, solicitations and contracting at the White House. She's now at the US Digital Service. And then um, 18F, Hillary Hartley, and her whole team who have done some really cool work with this um, Agile blanket purchase agreement that they put out. And I had many long phone calls with them where I like spent hours deciphering my notes afterward because I was getting so much knowledge dropped on me about how to do Agile procurement. I've tried to distill it down for you guys here. Um, it may not all make sense right away. And there are easier ways to do it too, but this is the way the federal government is doing it and finding it meets their needs. So, um, this is the Agile model that we, I showed you guys earlier. Um, you still do some anal analysis and planning in-house, but your statement of work covers that part of, of the work as well, with the idea that you'll continue to do analysis and planning throughout the sprints in partnership with the vendor. And um, what you ask people to respond to, so sorry, this, the statement of work is focused on agile process and expertise. So rather than a statement of work that describes the product, the statement of work describes what you want them to do. So like, do user research, like help us make visual designs, help us write user stories, help us prioritize the backlog, like actually build the thing, test it, deploy it. Um, and you, so you describe the, the, the tasks, the services you need, rather than the product that you'll be building. Um, and you're looking for demonstrations of experience and expertise and past work. Um, it doesn't mean it won't say anything about the product. You want to write about the product vision and the broad set of features you're looking for. Um, but you know that the product will emerge and evolve through the iterative process together. So what do your responses look like if they're not how much would it cost to do exactly these things? Uh, it's focused on their agile expertise and approach. Um, there are different ways to prove that. One of the ways 18F is doing it is by actually having them write code and submit an open source repo as part of their response. Um, the proposed team makeup and size, and also like who are the people, what are their skills and experience. Um, if you're doing it, depending on the pricing model, you may ask them to propose their sprint length, sprint structure, and how much each sprint will cost. And then um, examples of past work, which are testimonials again to that expertise. So how does the money work then? This is the question that like Michael kept asking me. He's like, how do I pay for it? Because I need a price tag attached to work. I need to hold the vendor accountable. And um, Tracy Walker at the White House is very committed to fixed price. She does not do time and materials contracts. She feels like the government needs to have a price tag attached to units of work, not just units of time, not just hourly rates, which is kind of tough for a lot of uh, web development shops because they often work on an hourly model and working on some sort of fixed price model is new. So here's how they do it. They spend the first two to four sprints doing what they call a baselining period, and this is time and materials. You're getting paid hourly. So if you have a five-person team, they're working 30 hours a week, whatever their hourly rate is for those people, that's your, your cost. Um, but they move into a fixed price model. And 
it, they may have multiple vendors doing baselining at the same time, and they're going to pick one, too. <laughs> so at the end, they establish their, the velocity of the team they're going to go with. So the team has kind of proven this is how much work we get done um, in every sprint. So it's like two-week sprints. Like, what's their average velocity, average number of user stories or story points completed um, in each sprint? There's often like a bracket, like they're completing between you know 10 to 12 or whatever, um, and they agree to it. So the vendor actually agrees to like we're gonna we're gonna continue to meet this velocity, and the government says we're gonna hold you to that, and you must for each sprint deliver this much completed work. But instead of what features it'll be or what requirements or what specs it'll be, it's what number of story points or what number of stories at what size will it be, and so then in the next sprint you pay that price for that amount of work. And the cool thing this allows to do is if the vendor starts speeding up and their, their team is working better, they can actually pull people off of it. They can pull a developer off or they can adjust their team size. That's up to them as long as they're meeting the deliverables they've committed to. Um, and it puts the risk on the vendor, but also that potentially that cost savings on the vendor, because um, at the end of the sprint, if they haven't completed that number of story points at the mutually agreed definition of done, which we can talk about a little bit, um, it's on them to complete them. They don't get to roll those over into the next sprint and say, sorry, we worked our 30 hours and didn't get to it. They have to complete it on their own and, or add another developer or whatever. So the government doesn't bear that risk. So what does it take for this to work? Um, really well-established story sizing guidelines and definition of done. So under the waterfall fixed price, what often happens when things are going wrong is like the the government and the vendor sit in a room with their lawyers <laughs> and they argue over the specs, the product requirements, and they're like, this was in there, it was in the scope, you have to do it, you have to do that, and you're not meeting scope right now. And they argue about that. What Tracy says is that like that kind, that, that dynamic, if it exists at all in Agile, it kind of gets shifted over to the sprint planning. So basically you're like, you're negotiating about, hey, this looks like a three-point story, not a, a five-point story, you know, and you're sort of adjusting, and that requires technical knowledge of the vendor, and it also requires sort of consistency, or at the, at the government, excuse me, requires sort of consistency there. And then at the end of the sprint, they look at the stories, and they've either accepted them as they've gone, or they accept them all at once, but either way, they're kind of validating that it meets the mutually agreed upon criteria for a completed story. So you have to always meet the established velocity, and you may also have incentive bonuses if they exceed the velocity. So if they like are doing even more, but rather than pulling people off, you can potentially get paid more for the sprint. So the other way to do it um, is time and materials, and this is much easier. Um, it also potentially means more risk for the government, and my sort of like emerging opinion, this is all still pretty new to me, is that I would only you really want to only do time and materials, I think, if you have a very trusting relationship with your vendor. You feel really good about the vendor that you've picked because you're paying them hourly and you have to trust that they're going to deliver really high quality work in each of those hours, which is obviously the ideal situation. Um, so this is what 18F's Agile BPA does. It establishes an hourly rate for certain different kinds of skill sets. People who then contract with those vendors under 18F's Agile BPA will be paying hourly. Um, there are some vendors who will only work hourly, at least as far as I can tell. Um, but you can still have a predictable burn rate. Like you, can, you know that each sprint is going to be a certain staffing size with a certain hourly rate for a certain number of hours in those two weeks or three weeks. Um, so you're not tying it to the stories or the story points. But you can, you can still track your velocity and start to see how quickly you're rolling through your backlog and when you're probably going to be able to hit your target release dates um, and how much you're going to spend to get there. It's just not locked in. It's more of an honest estimate. So this, um, these last couple slides, and then we will open it up to discussion, go to a question that I think someone back here had asked about, so how is this uh, culturally end up different than Waterfall when you're working with a vendor in an agile way? I think one of the biggest differences is the product owner, which we call the buyer or the purchaser in the, in the old way. <laughs> um, they don't, in the, in the old way, they do most of their work in writing the RFP. I'm writing the specs, and then once it's out, um, they and they're getting circuiting work back. Once they have a contract, it's like in reviewing the deliverables, which might only happen every three months or six months. In Agile, they are really hands-on. So they are going to coordinate and participate in user research and user testing throughout. They're going to own the backlog they, and participate in joint sprint planning. So every two weeks or three weeks, however long your sprints are, they're the ones, the, the government employee, the government manager is the one who tells the, the vendor what to work on in, in coordination with the vendor product manager. Um, they're going to accept user stories throughout the sprint or all at once at the end of the sprint. So like they, uh, in an ideal case, I think they are like fully transparent. They know what the team is completing day to day, and they're actually approving them or responding to them. Um, and they participate in sprint retrospectives and daily stand-ups. 
if they want to, in the, in the case of the daily stand-ups, to stay in touch with what the team's working on. This is a huge mindset shift for government purchasers. And then, if you want, your friend in IT, if they're a web developer and they are interested, they can participate, which is what Cindy's doing. And that can look like pair programming, participating in daily stand-ups, being a technical resource for the product owner, um, sprint retrospectives, and then maybe long-term sustainability if they're, then you have someone in-house who's familiar with the code base. And that adds transparency because you have someone day-to-day -day who can um, understand what the engineering team is doing and really even be part of the engineering team. Vendor responsibilities. Um, full transparency of the backlog and real-time work. Like, in order for Agile to, I think, really meet the risk reduction need that government people have because they're spending taxpayer dollars, I think they need to be, the government uh, person needs to be really keyed into what the Agile team is working on because they don't have that scope and specs to hold you to legally. Um, joint sprint planning, so being willing to plan your sprints collaboratively with your customer, uh, retro and a demo at the end of each sprint, including the customer in those things. Um, and then this is our iteration calendar that we're using with our current vendor. I thought you might like to see it. It's, I've tweaked it a little bit to be kind of generic, but you can see before the sprint, this is a sprint that starts on Thursdays, two weeks before it starts, and this is what the government person is participating in, a design and product meeting and then iteration planning. And the pre-planning and the engineering are going on just on the vendor side. And then um, the demo and joint team retro from the previous sprint are in gray. Daily stand-ups, purple is some user testing tasks that the city's involved in. And then as you get to the end of the sprint, you're gonna, have, you're gonna start keying up the planning for the next sprint, as well as doing a demo of the completed work and the um, joint team retrospective at the end. And it's all throughout this, you might be accepting user stories as they are delivered to you. So with that, I'll be quiet, and I would love to hear thoughts from you guys, and then also questions or insights, like what did you hear that resonated with you? What did you hear that maybe didn't, and it, it doesn't align with your experience? Because this is just one case in one city. Um, I thought that was really cool, and like just gave a lot of like really practical information about how like to write RFPs and like actually how to look for people. Um, I, I feel like one of the things that I would kind of anticipate coming from cities would be, you know, usually projects will have like a budget and like they'll want to know like, you know, like how much is this going to cost? And with the waterfall method, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of fake, right? It's like you have a project proposal that you give and it's like, but there's some sort of like imaginary semblance of like, oh, you get this by the end of it and it's done at this point and it costs this much. Whereas that kind of uh, charade is gone um, when, you, when you work in the agile process. So how do you work to kind of um, put up the people at ease? Or like, how, what, what do you do with that? Like when you have like a fixed budget or something and you want to know like, what do I get kind of at the end of this? Yeah. Or like, you know, the semblance of like some, a product that's good enough. Here's some thoughts. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to chime in, but I want to hear from other people too. So, I don't know if I need this. Um, Going back to a couple of your other questions, some of the questions are out there. Um, one of the things that we did, and um, and I wasn't familiar with Agile before we started this this last thing, but um, really what what sold the deal on on whether you have a budget, how much it is, what it is, all we had to say was, okay, so the last IT project, how successful was it? Was it on time? Uh, was it on budget? And there really wasn't anybody that could say that it was on time and on budget. And so we said, what the hell, let's try the agile approach. Um, and uh, you know, that was the selling point. It, it, it's not so much trying to sell the agile, it's trying to bring to reality that waterfall just doesn't work in an enterprise such as government. Um, and it's a mind shift, but it really goes to disselling uh, a waterfall approach or, or an enterprise application because all you have to do, and you can talk to any single government that's represented here and they'll have horror stories about that. So it's it's really that, you know, you had a fixed budget for your waterfall project. It didn't matter. It came in over budget. So why not try this approach? 94% of the government procurement failed in government. I sort of have a... Uh, a question that came up while I was watching the presentation. I wonder from like from the vendor perspective, like say hypothetically or maybe less hypothetically for some, if you're uh, working in this space already uh, or trying to scrabble out in this space, 
Um, how do you how do you switch between working agile or working waterfall? Uh, like, let's say you're marketing towards like mid size cities. I don't know. I'm making this up, but like you're going around and you're trying to pitch for projects to get work and some of the RFPs are waterfall and maybe some of them are agile. And so are you supposed to be able to do both or are you going to say like, Oh, as a shop, we only do agile and deny that business. And on from the government side, are you supposed to, or we're only going to do agile RFPs now, but we still are figuring that out. You know, there's a lot of, I think in a, that period of transition, like there's a lot of room for duplication of work and confusion and there's a couple of vendors in there and I'd love to hear what they think. I think that a lot of them, the at least the ones I've talked to, are kind of make an ethical choice that like we do agile, we think that's the right way. So we're just not gonna respond to waterfall ones. Or we're gonna respond to them describing an agile uh, process and maybe maybe we'll luck out. I don't know, what do you guys think, Wendy and Mark and others? Um, my name is Kathleen Feely, and um, with my good friend Art Chang over here, uh, I um, founded Casebook, and um, I, it's, we're a little different because we sell enterprise to state governments for child welfare and juvenile justice and integrated services, and um, we can't afford not to respond to waterfall RFPs because that's all that there are. There aren't very many, but they're coming out. Um, and uh, what we've done is go in and present what we have, and an agile, you know, iterative, user-centric, family-centric, very different than anything that's in any uh, requirements. Um, and so I just think that it's really important that we start doing. You know, if we talk uh, to people, they just go to lawyers. The contracting is a whole other issue. Uh, Art and I took 10 months to negotiate the contract in our first state. Because they, the lawyers, they just couldn't wrap their head around not paying by, for, by the milestone, which you know is not the way to build. But at any rate, um, I think that uh, they just people don't, at least in state governments, uh, they don't understand. They have a lot of rules. They have to. They feel like they have to be accountable to the citizens for tax money, even though every waterfall vendor in this space overshoots their budget by gazillions. Um, and uh, so I, I don't think that just talking, unless somebody like, even the president said about healthcare.gov, we ought to blow up the procurement process for IT. And you know, I loved it. It was in the New York Times. I loved it, but it didn't really change anything. So um, I, I am just, we're trying to educate states. We've been in lots of states, you know, showing them casebook, talking about how you should put this in, do your RFP for what you want, what you need, instead of how you should do it. And, um, and so, but my view is, you know, if you've got a product or you've got something to show that's better than anything that any waterfall person could, I don't, I sound so, I don't mean to sound so um, condescending, but if you have a product that's better, then show it or show somebody else's product that they could have, and, um, and then just keep working it. Um, by the way, uh, uh, Kathleen led, Kathleen's project won the CF, CFA Summit Tech Award this morning, so. Um, I, thought your, I think your question is really interesting um, because uh, one, of the, one of my questions was actually where is the role of the product manager and product owner in your project? Um, because in Agile, you, off, you usually have a product owner who ideally sits on the client side, right, on the, on the user side. And um, the, the implication of doing things in, in Agile, which is you, you can debate what Agile actually means because there's so many, so many varieties of it. Um, the one of the interesting notions between this waterfall choice and the agile choice is is actually one about business process reinvention because if you allow for openness in your process and a collaborative multi-party conversation along the way it inevitably leads to outcomes which result in changes in business process and so a lot of the resistance is actually this this 
innate fear that this will actually cause a business change. And it means that, for instance, middle managers become accountable because their actions are captured in the system. It means that you can find a more efficient way to do things, which then will take four workers out of the process and requires only two. It means that people don't have to spend time generating reports and analyses when those things can be automated because they're actually needed just in time instead of being delivered two months later. And so the, the, the people don't actually understand this, but they, they actually can see that when you invite everybody in to actually provide their input into this process, the process itself unveils all these changes that just have to happen. Yeah, so, so real quick, from, again, from the vendor side um, to your question. Um, and, and when I was doing services, you know, I, I wouldn't actually bid on anything unless I had actually been into the customer and had a chance to understand what they wanted and also to impart, uh, you know, some, some education onto them as far as, hey, you know, they're, they're going down the waterfall approach and, and trying to teach them about what Agile can really do for them, right? So that we can try and help them create that RFP down that Agile path. Um, especially, you know, if you're going to come out with something that's firm fixed price. I mean, I would never bid on something that's firm fixed price without knowing exactly what I'm getting into as part of my, my initial bid. So, um, you know, to your point, you know, the RFPs that come out now should be all about what we want, not how we want it done, and let the vendor decide and teach you or, or propose to you how they would best do it, and then you, you know, pick the, the uh, path that you know, you think is going to be the most successful and the most cost efficient, right? Uh, another, I'm trying to help those that are trying to convince their agencies, because I think that the message does need to be spread. Um, one of the, a couple other things that we um, used was, was analogies, um, trying to show people or tell people how how agile is in in other municipal uh, activities, you know, um, cities go out and buy fire trucks. They don't tell the manufacturer exactly when to put the tires on and you know when to install the radio and this kind of stuff. They say, "I want a fire truck that pumps water, that's red, that you know has lights and sirens." If you can kind of get that mentality going, you're not at the factory telling them exactly when to tighten that nut and when to tighten that bolt. Those are the kinds of things that we had to talk to with. Um, our purchasing agents that work for me that didn't understand the pushback, our city attorneys that didn't understand the pushback. So it's, it's really trying to convince them or just educate them on the analogy of this is the same thing as we do in other areas. It's just we've never done it in technology. So it's, you know, it's that kind of thing um, in, in trying to describe those, those things. And I agree. I think you should have that relationship before you, you're, you're working with your customers. Kind of piggy piggybacking off of that idea, might there be, um, and in Tulsa we're a relatively small town, so we have um, a close relationship with, our, with the city IT department, and we have an even closer relationship with city council. Um, so might, that be, might there be an opportunity to even help departments within the city um, write these RFPs and, and kind of be educating them in the process? I mean, I know it, it would probably put a lot more burden on us as a brigade because we're putting in volunteer time, not in writing code, but in educating <laughs> uh, city workers. Um, but do, do you think that, um, that that might pay off? Sorry to jump in, but the contract that we did do with Indiana is online uh, in Indiana. You know, every contract is supposed to be um, open to the public. And it does have um, how, you, how you can pay, how, states, how the state paid for what they got. How, how did they pay you guys? I'm curious. What was pardon the, me? How did they pay you? What was, what was the structure? Well, it was, a, it was 
subsidized by the Casey Foundation. So it was a little bit different, but it just the language was about um, you know what they had, what we said we were going to do, and it was about what we were like the fire truck, not about the tires. And it had you know like it has to have a steering wheel and it has to have you know a transmission and all that stuff, whatever. Um, but um, has to be able to pump water. So we had all that, but. We they we did not have and then we used MVP uh, minimum viable product kind of um, stuff so it's just can be done and the other thing I just thought of is that um, states do do RFIs or states and governments do RFIs and there's where you also have a chance by getting in there and talking to them about uh, a request for information and by telling them about your product. So encouraging people, it adds a step, and government's so slow, but encouraging your uh, potential, either your government or your um, customers, potential customers, to do an RFI and sending it out to new technologists uh, or companies, then you have a chance to influence, let them know what's out there. And also, as I said before, just getting out and showing them. I just think it's really. So um, a concrete example, the state of Oklahoma just voted, uh, I think it was last month, on um, allowing, uh, legally allowing online voter registration. And so um, one of the things that has perked this issue up for us at the local brigade um, is that there are many states who are doing online voter registration and there are many systems that are open source and free. Um, and so our worry is that the state of Oklahoma is going to pay some legacy vendor $50 million to create a system um, that we could do for the price of a beer and a pizza. Um, and, and so we'd like to have a conversation with the state of Oklahoma about how do you save taxpayer money and implement a robust system uh, while still uh, fulfilling this um, requirement that's now law. Um, and, and we don't understand, like you said, our RFI. I don't know what the difference between an RFI and an RFP is. So, um, um, how, like, I guess I'm asking, how do we interject ourselves in that conversation without being adversarial? Because um, so far, we've just been um, gaining progress by going to city council and yelling at them um, instead of being more collaborative and working with them. Um, and, you know, we potentially blow that system up by a factor of 10 if we go to now our state capital and yell at them. Uh, RFI and RFP, I'll talk to anybody about afterwards, but I'm going to give this answer to Art. Um, I didn't answer just who I was. I'm, I'm, my name is Art Chang. Um, I have, um, I'm a government official. I am one of four board members who oversees the New York City Campaign Finance Board, which is the largest public matching funds program for candidates running for public office. And then we're, I also chair something called the, NY, the New York City Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, which is a multi-agency kind of watchdog over the elections process in New York. And then in my private sector world, I'm a, I'm a technology incubator guy who uh, helped partnered with Kathleen to help build Casebook and other things that lead to social good. Um, but, the, um, but the question about the voting in particular, um, I mean, one of the, there's lots of overlapping issues. Um, third party technologies are allergic to some states, and so you have to, you have to go and understand the culture of the procurement process in a state because licensing is different from a custom build. Um, there is actually a, um, uh, something called OSET Foundation, which I don't know if you've heard of, OSET, O-S-E-T, OSET. So it's uh, OSET.org. Um, they have um, a, probably the only HAVA compliant um, voter registration system um, that consists of a hardware software stack um, that um, uh, enables states to essentially customize um, a, a compliant voting system to their own particular state rules and regulations, because every state is a bit different. Um, so I would, I, would, I would just kind of you know, turn you to that. Um, but this, this addresses kind of an, another interesting question, which is that, 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 the, that, that um, Case Commons confronted, which is that you know, so many of government technologies actually are potentially replicable in other states. And there is a, a, a federal law called FFI that, that essentially says that if, if federal funds are used to pay for 
the procurement of a custom technology, the intellectual property is in essence becomes a, pu becomes a public good for the state and federal government uh, to exchange freely among themselves. And so if you're a vendor and you actually have built some proprietary IP and you want to do business with the state, this puts you in a very, very awkward situation because you need to be able to actually be able to trace the flow of funds to ensure that you have no FFI pollution, um, which is very complicated. And so open source becomes another interesting avenue to actually to, to kind of navigating this. Uh, we did this with um, NYC Votes. We, we, we said, well, you know, the, um, that actually voting is kind of like Amazon.com. You're actually you know, shopping for your, you know, your representatives for democracy. So you need a consumer engagement platform, but you also need a merchant finance piece tied into our back end. And so what we did, we, we put together a public-private partnership um, that on a pro bono basis built a piece of software that then became where the IP became open sourced. And what that did was it enabled the vendor to potentially have a future revenue stream that could be kind of like a red hat or for, you know, with respect to Linux, where they contributed the software for free, but then they enabled other, other vendors and themselves to potentially bid on maintenance and additional modules and other things on top of that. Um, so you know, that's, that's another way to do that. It's um, 5.30 and everyone I think wants to get to the drinks. So I'm gonna um, cut it off. Uh, some quick closing thoughts touching on a few of the things I heard people mentioning. Um, it's very hard to convince an organization to change how they do this. I think that there's a couple different tactics. Um, one is it's a lot about reassurance. Like, don't worry, this is gonna work better. It's gonna have, you're gonna get your product faster. It's gonna cost less. Like. It's a little, it's like a very human thing. Like the, you're asking them to change the way they do their work. And I think that um, the vendor can't necessarily be the one doing that reassurance. Like it needs to be a third party like your brigade or like um, someone internally who becomes your internal advocate. If you are a government who you know you wanna pursue this, I would pick like one employee who's a real enthusiastic cheerleader and like get them fully trained <laughs> and like let them hold everyone's hand. Because I think it's really important for the purchasers and buyers to have someone to lean on, someone to call up and say like, well, hey, wait, I'm not sure about this part. Like how do I write this? How do I deal with the vendor on this? Um, so if you can find that internal advocate and if when you're a vendor, if you're, if you're working with a government who has a person like that, it's gonna go a lot more smoothly. And they don't have to be the product owner. I think it can be someone more centrally in the city. Um, another thing that's really helped us, I think, is leaning on the actually, like, Agile's pretty well established. <laughs> like, this isn't that new. It's almost two decades old. Um, it's become standard in the private sector. Like, everybody's doing it. Like, name drop big corporations they like. Um, though, and, like, the White House gave us these sample template contracts, like, and RFPs. Like, don't you think the White House has it figured out? You know? So I think there's... Um, there's the things you can do to lean on that. I would say, I mean, very specifically in Oklahoma, like there are people from 18 who would get on the phone with them and be like, you should really do this in this way, <laughs> you know? Um, so don't be afraid to like tap your network and tap uh, trusted advocates as you're building your credibility. Um, and if, if you're a vendor, that's a lot harder. Like they, they I think government isn't reasonably skeptical of, of vendors telling them how they should do their work, so. I'll, have, I'll be here for a few more minutes if you guys want to talk, but um, I want to like release everyone to go into the afternoon. So <laughs> thank you for coming, and thank you guys for participating and making this a roundtable rather than just a lecture.